Rocky Flats Cold War Museum Oral History Project. I'm interviewing Ken Calkins at his house in Golden, um, Hannah Nordhaus, and it is the 2nd of February, 2005. Um, so, Ken, to get started, if you could just tell me a little bit about your uh, background, where you were born, what your parents did, where you're educated, that sort of thing. All right. Uh, going, going way, way back, I was uh, born uh, on, a, on a small farm southwest of Greeley, Colorado, uh, west of Evans. It's actually now probably inside the Greeley uh, Incorporated City Limits uh, there. Born in 1926 and my father was uh, was purchasing the farm that he, he worked and uh, when the Depression uh, uh, fell in in October of 1929, uh, very suddenly he owed more money against the farm than it was worth and so so he did uh, lose the farm, uh, you know, early in the Depression, and and the Depression years uh, w were fairly difficult for our family, although they, although they were for everybody at that time, so so I didn't really know the difference. It just seemed normal to me. My, uh, so after that, uh, my father uh, worked on the, on the roads uh, for a time, and then uh, in uh, or approximately 1930, I think it was, we moved to the uh, the town of Loveland in northern Colorado, and that's where I grew up. Uh, I went through the, the public schools, and and my childhood uh, schoolhood memories are uh, are uh, associated with Loveland. My uh, father uh, really then became a a carpenter, and and that's how he uh, he made a living uh, during the remainder of his life uh, there. My mother uh, never really worked uh, outside the home, although for a time she did, uh, during the Depression, did some babysitting and, and domestic work to supplement the family income. My, uh, my uh, character, probably my, my uh, philosophies of life, were, were very substantially influenced by the uh, conditions during the Depression, as were most people of my, my age and generation uh, there. In, uh, at the uh, tail end of the, the Depression, of course, it was uh, closely followed by the Second World War, and, uh, and that's what uh, was going on when I was in high school. So that was, a, uh, again, a big uh, influence upon my, my uh, nature, my, my character. I uh, graduated from Loveland High School in 1944 and went immediately into the service of uh, the Army Air Corps at that time. As a matter of fact, uh, I was riding on the train to the induction center on uh, June 6th, D-Day of, of 1944. My, uh, I was in the Air Corps, but but really got in a little bit late to have any uh, significant role in the in the Second World War, and so I had a undistinguished uh, military service and uh, and did was then uh, discharged in uh, let's see November of 1945. Uh, uh, there, I uh, following that I entered the University of Colorado in, uh, in the spring semester of 1946. Uh, I majored in chemical engineering and received a, a BS degree in chemical engineering in 1949. The, uh, at that time, there was really little, little industry, uh, certainly no chemical industry in, in Colorado, and so I uh, was interested in the in the, uh, particularly the petrochemical industry, and uh, and left uh, Colorado then to, uh, uh, my first job was in uh, a natural gasoline plant in the Oklahoma Panhandle. And then uh, in, uh, the following year, I married uh, my wife, who is really a local girl, uh, lived on a farm between Loveland and Johnstown. And uh, we were married in 1950 and, and went to uh, 
back to the Oklahoma Panhandle. It, uh, I wasn't greatly enthused about the Panhandle, and and my wife was even less so. And and the job that I had there, although uh, was satisfactory, it uh, didn't appear to be leading any place. Uh, no, no real opportunities for development. So. Uh, started looking around and in, uh, in 1952 I uh, uh, well, was looking fairly, fairly seriously. We came back to uh, Colorado for a vacation at that time and that's when I first heard that uh, you know some uh, rather rather vague, uh, almost mysterious uh, at that time uh, plant was being built on the uh, on the rocky flats between uh, Boulder and Golden uh, there and I had you know I had driven across that area uh, a few times when I was going to college at, uh, at CU and at that time there was really nothing there uh, there except some some bare uh, mesas with a bunch of rocks and very few trees at any rate uh, I did, uh, they did have a, a local office uh, uh, there in employment office in 1952. I did apply and was told uh, that, that they had really just finished filling their technical staff and wouldn't, uh, didn't have any openings there, but they would keep my name on file. Well, we all know what that means. The file uh, under those conditions is usually a wastebasket. Uh, so I kind of uh, forgot about it and, uh, and really uh, did nothing further uh, myself. But, uh, 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 but looked at a couple of other uh, areas and uh, did indeed uh, submit an application uh, in a petrochemical plant, uh, really quite a large one, in the Texas Panhandle, a, a town called Pampa about 50 miles northeast of Amarillo. Uh, they, uh, they hired me right away, so, so I went to work uh, there in the, uh, in the Texas Panhandle in, in petrochemical production. The work itself there was, was very interesting. I, I liked that work, uh, um, had a good job, the company was fine, but, but uh, uh, my wife and I uh, really felt we did not wish to spend the rest of our life in the uh, in the Texas Panhandle, and we were considering uh, some other things. When suddenly, from my standpoint, out of the clear blue, in uh, must have been the the spring, probably the late spring of 1955, I got a letter from uh, what was then the the operating contractor at Rocky Flats, Dow Chemical Company saying they had reviewed my earlier application and uh, wanted if I was still interested in a position. And that itself rather surprised me because I, I, uh, I say I'd thought that was the end of it. I did uh, uh, write back and say I was interested and so I, uh, I was interviewed uh, by the fellow who a fellow named Bob Hawley. He became my immediate supervisor uh, on the, his way through Amarillo and uh, was offered and accepted a position and so I went to work at Rocky Flats uh, on, let's see, August 8th, 1955. Um, so that's, uh, that's how I got to Rocky Flats uh, briefly and and spent uh, oh just about thirty five years there after that. Wow. Um, Want to tell me your career tra trajectory there? Okay. Yes, I did uh, uh, enter into a group which was uh, the chemical engineering group of uh, what was called a technical staff. the The technical staff was a uh, uh, kind of the forerunner of the research and development uh, group. We didn't, uh, we did very little research at that time. The, the technical staff was mostly a development uh, group. 
uh, you know, looking into and and uh, working on on production problems related to uh, to chemical processing. Uh, uh, initially, I did uh, uh, work on corrosion, some uh, some water treatment, uh, etc. And uh, oh, and, and some uh, early chemical processing problems uh, in the areas of, especially of enriched uranium and plutonium processing there. Uh, there were a few things that that rather were surprising to me uh, as I went to work there. Uh, for one thing, uh, as I say, I'd worked in a very large petrochemical plant, and at Rocky Flats, uh, to me, by comparison, all of the production was was very small scale. Now that's that's certainly understandable when you consider the nature of what what we were working with, but but everything was was quite little uh, to me. Another thing was that uh, that I hadn't thought about uh, kind of surprised me that it was basically a a, a daytime operation five days a week. Uh, you know the plants that I had been in. Uh, by their nature, when you started up the processes, uh, um, you essentially kept them running a year, and, and a year later they were shut down for major maintenance uh, work, uh, maybe and then restarted, uh, so that it went 24 hours a day, seven days a week. At Rocky Flats, it was uh, oh, seven hours a day, uh, five days a week. So. So it seemed to me at that time that uh, all that expensive equipment was sitting there idle most of the time. Uh, there. And that's, uh, again, that's uh, the nature of the work. Uh, I just hadn't really thought about it previously. A third thing that surprised me a, a little bit was there was a, uh, the, the plant was very compartmentalized. Uh, a lot of that was intentional based upon, you know, the, the concept of security at that time. They really uh, preferred that, that uh, most people did not uh, know all aspects of the, uh, of the operation. They, they really they wanted for security purposes to keep it uh, compartmentalized. But in, part of it was also the um, the nature and character of some of the uh, personnel that were operating the plant. Um, you, uh, you probably know that at that time there were four... Uh, Here, I want to stop it for a second. Okay, so you were saying there were four people. Okay, four. Yes, uh, uh, the plant uh, from a production standpoint was basically organized in, in, in four plants. We called Plant A, B, C, and D, uh, and the A was uh, was depleted uranium processing, uh, uh, headed by a gentleman named Bob Eastman. Plant B was enriched uranium uh, operations, uh, supervised by a gentleman named Lyle Zotner. C was plutonium operations, uh, headed by uh, Bud Venable. And D was was assembly activity, uh, headed by by uh, Ed Walco. Well, these individuals, with the possible exception of Bob Eastman, who had who had not really come from the nuclear industry, but uh, the other three individuals, in particular, were were a pretty strong individuals. And they really wanted to be a king of their of their own empire, and and there was a, and the group that I was in, the technical staff, was supposedly, you know, a, a, a encompassed the, the entire plant operations, but I found that uh, it was rather difficult to really get uh, make inroads into any of those uh, the B, C, and D plants. 
because uh, for one thing, and I hadn't been aware of this when I uh, signed on, they each had particular B and C, uh, a little less in, in plant in the assembly. They each had some of their own development and, uh, and testing people anyway, and they really uh, uh, didn't particularly welcome our, uh, our presence. They, uh, they kind of treated us as outsiders, and especially if they learned that, you know, the day before we had been in one of the other plants, they, uh, they were afraid we might, whatever, tell their secrets or, or uh, something. So I was uh, rather surprised at, at those conditions, and it, it did take, uh, oh, some time to, uh, to kind of work in to a, a feeling in, uh, that, you know, we were really participating as, as one team for the entire uh, plant operations. But those, uh, well then, then going on uh, from there on my assignments, uh, Later, uh, first of all, in, in the sometime in the early 1960s, uh, like maybe like 1962, wherever in there, there was a change in uh, philosophy within the what was then the Atomic Energy Commission, the forerunner to the Department of Energy. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> And they, uh, whereas previously they had uh, wanted, had made it a, a point that they had uh, duplicate facilities uh, within the United States for any uh, important processing. In other words, uh, the, the uranium, the enriched uranium uh, activities that we had uh, were pretty much a duplicate. Uh, maybe even on a smaller scale, of facilities at Oak Ridge. Our plutonium uh, production activities were duplicated, uh, particularly at the Hanford plant in, uh, in Washington, the state of Washington. Uh, they had some other assembly facilities in, uh, in Los Alamos uh, there. Well, sometime in there, the, uh, the Atomic Energy Commission uh, changed its philosophy and recognized that this duplication was, was costing them a lot of money. So they, uh, they uh, de-emphasized uh, the, the duplication and Rocky Flats uh, pretty much lost all of its uh, enriched uranium uh, processing responsibilities. We picked up most of the plutonium processing uh, and fabrication responsibilities so that the, uh, the activity at Hanford uh, then along those lines was minimized. Uh, we certainly did, did essentially all of the assembly of facilities. So there was a, a change in, uh, in that philosophy uh, to, to emphasize our plutonium uh, work. And at the same time, uh, uh, kind of related to, but a little independent. There was also a great, uh, or, uh, an increase in production uh, uh, scheduling levels. So as a result, we needed to to increase the um, our production capability for plutonium, especially. And so my group uh, really began working a, a great deal on on processes to. Uh, to improve production or uh, plutonium chemical recovery operations, uh, we worked on making continuous uh, processes, uh, improving them, uh, reducing direct hand exposure, uh, uh, the, this, uh, which of course contributed to radiation, that sort of thing. So a, a large part of the rest of my career had to do with uh, with plutonium processing, uh, the the development of processes for it, uh, later the design and construction of facilities for plutonium processing, the uh, administration of the 
of the work, uh, that sort of thing. So I was uh, 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 really basically uh, uh, emphasized plutonium processing work. Uh, so it was research to uh, develop better processing? Actually, the after uh, it was something like 1962 when we did have a, a reorganization and that's when the research and development department was formed. Uh, by my interest and inclination, uh, I was not so much uh, of a researcher as, uh, as development, uh, and there's, there's kind of a, uh, it's sort of a line, uh, it's not a very clear line between research and development, but I was more on, in the development area of, of the the practical and uh, and product productive application of, of research uh, uh, results uh, to uh, to plutonium processing. So I really moved from the research side to the uh, development, and then to the actual operations uh, uh, side uh, in later years. I uh, I later became a the superintendent of building 771, uh, where we at that time did the uh, essentially all plutonium chemical uh, uh, reprocessing to produce purified plutonium metal uh, suitable for further fabrication operations and, uh, and, uh, and did the recovery work. And then I was uh, also considerably later the uh, the first uh, superintendent of building 371, which was a rather ill-fated uh, uh, facility intended to replace building 771 for production, uh, plutonium production operations and there. And it was ill-fated because it came online right when the mission was well, it, it's really a little deeper than that. Uh, I think we can, uh, uh, that makes a nice uh, uh, excuse for why it, it never really operated, but uh, a lot of money was spent on that facility to, uh, to be a, a much you know, better, safer, better, uh, whatever, improved replacement for building 771. As we actually got into the into the uh, testing and startup uh, phase of it, you know, writing procedures, uh, testing the equipment, getting ready to operate it, it became clear that the design of a facility was really not satisfactory from, uh, from an operating standpoint. And in truth, it would never have operated in its initial design uh, uh, condition uh, as it was intended. Uh, it was, as a matter of fact, even before the shutdown, uh, a large project had been initiated to to rebuild it so that it would work. Uh, there, there were a number of reasons for that, but the um, anyway, the result was that it, in my opinion, building 371 as initially constructed, was a great big white elephant uh, there. What, uh, what specifically, what wasn't functional about the initial? Well, the, uh, uh, there were a whole bunch of things. The, um, <laughs> for one thing, you know, I mentioned previously that my surprise at Rocky Flats was the equipment was so small. Well, in building 371, it turns out a lot of things had been designed to be way too big. And because of the nature of the work with plutonium, you know, it, uh, you really need small equipment for, for several reasons. So some of the equipment there, some, um, uh, we had an, a, an incinerator to replace the, uh, the incinerator in building 771 that was way too big. It was housed in a 
uh, in a room that was going to be extremely hot when it was in operation. The hot as in heat. Hot as in temperature, right? Uh, 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 probably hot as in contaminated, also. But uh, yeah, both of those things. But it uh, would have been extremely difficult to maintain that on an on a supplied air basis. Uh, ion exchange columns that were in there were were put in very high columns, uh, changing out the resin, uh, ion exchange resin used in purification uh, was going to be very difficult uh, uh, in those columns. Again, maintenance was a, was a problem. They had put in the design uh, electric motors uh, inside glove boxes and felt that they could protect them against corrosion by applying a, a uh, corrosion protection paint on the outside. We had found uh, years ago in building 771 that that just uh, did not work very well. So there were a lot of, uh, of design features that, that were really very poor about it that were going to keep it from working. There. Well, who, who designed this and, and well, uh, what worked and what didn't. Uh, uh, a lot of blame could be shared by a lot of people and a lot of organizations, uh, really. Uh, certainly the, the initial criteria were prepared by, by a team from, from a Dow Chemical Company, the, the company uh, running the plant when it first started. Uh, I was not on that team, so I can, uh, I can say it wasn't my fault, but but uh, whether I would have done any better is is, uh, is not certain. But the the criteria were not uh, well uh, well written in order to get what was wanted. The architect engineering firm was a firm named Brown and Root uh, out of California, and I guess I would lay most of the blame. Uh, on them, but but I emphasize they were not alone uh, there. So so a lot of the problem was them. The work itself was uh, uh, the construction work uh, in the building of the plant was really satisfactory from the standpoint that they uh, they built the plant the way it was designed, uh, which is what the construction company has to do and. And I didn't have any big uh, complaints about about the construction. It was it was mainly the the design concepts and then the the detailed design that came out of that those concepts that uh, that were the problem I felt. So um, so while, when you took over as supervisor of 371 and discovered. How did, how did you discover it wasn't going to work? <laughs> well, uh, uh, because of, uh, actually I can remember, uh, <laughs> uh, as I got the assignment, let's see, that would have been in, uh, I guess, 1976. The uh, Rockwell International succeeded Dow was the operating contractor on July 1st of 1975. Uh, I was at that time uh, superintendent of building 771, uh, and we thought we had operating problems there too. But um, then in, in 19, oh, about Roughly the, the summer of 1976, maybe a, a year or, or a little more after a Rockwell assumed the co contract, the construction schedule was such that uh, we were supposed to to start full-scale operation approximately a year from that time. So I was. Um, I was assigned as a startup manager, and uh, and then uh, would be the 
the building operations manager. When I went to work, uh, several of, of the people who had, had been on the uh, Dow Pro or Rockwell project team previously were, were still there, and I kind of moved in uh, uh, on them, and they were, they were signed on the, the team. I said uh, uh, to them essentially, boy, we really got to get to work to uh, do this testing and write these procedures and, uh, and get, get everything ready for, to start full-scale operation in a year. And they kind of uh, chuckled a little bit and uh, said, well, they uh, didn't think we had to, to break our neck uh, doing it, or something to that effect. That wasn't their words. But they had already begun to realize that there were some, some big problems. And so you know, we, uh, we did get uh, some additional technical people assigned to the team uh, there, and, and they began uh, you know, working with the equipment and looking at it and preparing procedures. And, uh, and most of those uh, fellows, you know, we'd, when we had our technical uh, meetings, um, most of the news that I got was bad news from the, from the standpoint of, of startup uh, and operations. And so I, uh, as I began to, uh, and the light began to get through to me, I began to report this and <clears throat> And in the nature of the things we do, my uh, news was not welcomed uh, there. Here was a, whatever, $250 million uh, a system that was going to uh, solve all the nation's problems in plutonium processing. That's, that's a kind of a, a, a general statement there, but, but, uh, but nobody within Rockwell, nobody within the Department of Energy, uh, uh, it had changed from AEC by that time to the Department of Energy. Nobody wanted to hear that news uh, there. And, uh, and I'm basically a technical person, but I recognize you know, uh, the politics that exist too, and, and uh, it, was, uh, it was not easy to, to start taking that message saying, well, uh, you know, we're not going to start up on time, and we're we're going to need to get a lot more money to to rebuild in order to to operate. So, so it was from that standpoint, uh, you know, not a you know, really a very good uh, uh, period in there. So, is that where you finished up your career? Well, uh, sort of. Uh, well, let me uh, speak to a few other things uh, that happened along the way, though. Uh, but before I got there, uh, in uh, on uh, uh, the notes that you um, had given me, you asked about a, a few incidents that that had occurred. You know what I might remember, uh, and I remember most of them uh, very well, even those going way way back there. Uh, one of the the one of my first experiences at Rocky Flats that I, I can remember uh, was handling plutonium. Now, in the, uh, the design of the units uh, when I went to work was uh, an old-fashioned design in which uh, plutonium, you know, that goes into the weapons was uh, actually designed as a ball or, or a couple of parts. And the, uh, and the total ball was, uh, oh, maybe a, a large golf ball or a small baseball uh, there. And it, uh, we then uh, plated it with a nickel plating. And it was actually removed from the glove box lines uh, you know, for, for use in the parts. And I can uh, uh, recall, you know, the first time uh, somebody handed me a uh, one of these plutonium balls uh, there to hold in my direct hand uh, there and feel its weight and its uh, 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 and its warmth and that you know in later years of course lots of people handle plutonium through gloves and a glove box but the uh, the handling of the direct uh, plutonium ball was, was uh, kind of interesting because it 
you really felt the, uh, you could tell the density of it. And the density you know, is roughly a 50% greater than, than of lead. So, so you could tell that was really a heavy material. And it was interesting to feel directly the, the warmth of the plutonium uh, you know, the, from the internal radioactive decay. So that was one thing that I recall. Uh, then there were a number of other incidents uh, uh, too. The, uh, the first of, of significance was in uh, building 771 when we had a, oh, an explosion, a uh, uh, chemical eruption, eruption perhaps, in a, a uh, what was called the East Chemline, in which a, um, a precipitator column would had a, a minor explosion uh, resulting in some contamination spread. And several people, uh, I recall the name Leonard Holman, who was, I don't know if he's ever showed up on any of your, any of your lists, but, but he was significantly contaminated uh, uh, in it, I know. And uh, I've kind of lost track of Leonard and don't know whether he's still living uh, even. But uh, I know as a result of that, then my, uh, uh, the group that I was in uh, uh, worked on, on the cause of that and what could be done to, uh, to prevent that from recurring. And, and we had found that it uh, occurred as a result of some, some autocatalytic uh, decomposition of hydrogen peroxide uh, synthesized by high iron in the solution. So in our group, you know, we worked on, a, on methods to remove the iron and, and install a refrigeration unit to uh, prevent that from happening again. And then uh, somewhat after that, we had the, uh, we, the well-known building a, or room 180 fire in 1957. Uh, there, which, uh, which was really a, a pretty big event. And I was, uh, at the time, you know, I was doing some work, not, the, at the, not at the time of the fire per se, but the day before the fire and, and for some time before that, a, uh, a, a friend uh, of mine were doing some work on, a, some development work on a new precipitation process in room 180. And I can recall uh, when I heard that, uh, my goodness, there's a big fire at Rocky Flats in room 180, I was suddenly all worried about whether or not it was something that, <laughs> that we had done to cause that. It turns out it was not. It was in an adjoining glove box, uh, started in a, in a can of chips that had been left there. but. Uh, but I can indeed recall the uh, the instant uh, in fighting the fire and uh, you know, and clean up of the aftermath, which was a you know, which was kind of a big mess uh, there, and that was uh, certainly very significant uh, there, and uh, certainly we learned something about burning plutonium chips at that time, but perhaps we didn't learn as much as we should have. Because uh, then later, of course, in uh, 1969, that's quite a bit later, uh, we had the big fire in building 776, uh, which, uh, which caused, caused major uh, shock waves uh, throughout Rocky Flats and the and the uh, AEC system. Uh, that, at that time, maybe still, has been called the largest industrial fire of all time. I think that's pretty misleading, uh, in a way, if you talk about the, the uh, it, it was defined as the largest industrial fire on the basis of, of the money that it took to, to clean up and to rebuild the facilities in a much improved manner f than they, uh, they had been in the first place. But from the standpoint of, 
of uh, damage to the environment. There was really none. A tiny little bit of a contamination was released uh, or was tracked outside, but but for the most part there was no effect uh, outside the building. Nobody was hurt in the fire uh, there. Uh, nobody was uh, certainly killed or injured uh, there. Uh, it was a big internal problem, but uh, but in my opinion, it was kind of mislabeled uh, the largest industrial fire. I think uh, one thing that has not been given the attention that it, it should was the the terrific effort uh, that was uh, accomplished in in a cleaning up from the fire and uh, resuming work. Uh, the cleanup was done under the supervision of a fellow named Bruce Owen. Uh, and again, I've kind of lost track of Bruce. Uh, I, he had retired. I'm not sure, sure whether he is still living. But the initial cleanup work was done by, by a salaried people working on a, on a volunteer basis now maybe there was some internal pressure to volunteer, but but nobody was forced to to go in there uh, and supply air uh, if they really objected. So and it was, as I say, all supervised by Bruce. Uh, we went in there and, and started uh, cleaning up that stuff, and it was really indeed a a, a great mess inside. In addition, of course, there was. There was a large amount of plutonium spread all around uh, the area where, uh, where you know, we didn't really know where everything was. There was an awful lot of water left from the from fighting the fire uh, there. Uh, mixing water with plutonium is very undesirable from a criticality point of view, and so so it was uh, certainly within possibility that we could have had a, a, a criticality uh, uh, event, not just an infraction, but a real a critical explosion, criticality explosion as a result of that. But because of, as I say, very very thorough planning by, by Bruce, by a diligent work, by, you know, by all of the cleanup team, uh, really there were, uh, there were no real problems, no accidents, no injuries. Uh, Within the, the cleanup, it took a long time to get it uh, done, but it was indeed finally done. Did you um, participate in the cleanup? Did you go into the building? Uh, pardon me? Did you go into the building and participate in the, in the cleanup? Yes, I was, um, I was one of the, quote, volunteers. Now, at that time, most of us from a, you know, from a volunteer standpoint, initially, uh, Worked uh, one day a week. We, you know, we had a, a regular job that we fulfilled, and then on one day a week we would go uh, there. You know, suit up in our supplied air and go in and, and work on uh, on recovery material. Uh, certainly, in uh, later and after most of the plutonium had been uh, cleaned up and accounted for, there was you know lots of con contamination until the end, but. But uh, later, after after the initial stages, then indeed it became a uh, a work. You know, hourly people assigned as decontamination workers were uh, started working there on a regular cleanup uh, basis uh, there. So uh, yes, I was one of them. Uh, I was not. Uh, I was not. You know, on the on the management team uh, there just. Just went in there. What was it like? Oh, it's hard to describe. Uh, we the room itself, you know, even before the fire, and this certainly led to uh, some of the severity of the fire. But the within the, the total industry, and you can see this repeated elsewhere, it wasn't unique to Rocky Flats, that something is built with a, 
you know, to certain design capacity and, uh, and certain standards there. And then as time goes on, uh, you want to squeeze more production out of those same facilities uh, without uh, spending more money. So after the initial construction of Building 776, uh, we had really, really put more equipment in there than it was designed for, and we had put in, in lots of, and this was a key, uh, because of some high exposures that had been been encountered in, in earlier years, not just recently. But we installed in Building 776 uh, large slabs of, uh, of uh, uh, suddenly I can't think of the word, uh, a polyethylene, uh, or no, not polyethylene. No. I can't think of the word. Anyway, large slabs of an organic material shielding uh, there to reduce neutron exposure to workers uh, on the outside. Uh, in later years, it uh, turned out rather funny. We went back to see how much attention had been given to the flammability of that material. And it turns out my group had conducted some some tests on the flammability of it, uh, you know, before it, we actually started uh, installing it, and found out that it was indeed flammable, and uh, and if, if exposed to high temperatures, uh, you know, could could ignite. But it was relatively easy to extinguish, you know, if you could do that on a small basis. So um, so we knew about that. But nevertheless, we had gone ahead and in installed uh, a very large quantities of that uh, neutron shielding. We'd put in, uh, so I say, crammed a lot more equipment in there. Overhead, we had uh, you know, large ventilation ductwork uh, held up by, by hangers uh, there. And in the fire, once the fire got going, Initially, there was a reluctance to use water because of this, this well-known uh, problem of, of uh, water and uh, uh, moderating the, the plutonium to cause a criticality. So water was not used uh, uh, initially, and, and probably they, uh, they withheld use of water for longer than, uh, than they should have. By the time they did start to use water to try to fight it, uh, then all that shielding was just burning so fiercely that the, the water uh, just did not extinguish it. So the result of all of this was that, you know, that glove box windows had been burned out, of course, uh, plutonium spread around. Uh, the Much of the ductwork which uh, had been up overhead on hangers, uh, the lead anchors had, had melted and pulled out, so ductwork uh, pieces, you know, were spread all over the floor. Uh, uh, there were ashes, there were uh, remains of this shielding, uh, just a, so I say, it's hard to describe, it was a, uh, like a big mechanical jungle in there when we first started going in to, uh, to clean it up uh, there. And I understand it was dark? Yes, oh, yeah, right. Initially, right. There were no lights uh, left in there, very dark. So you would set up, um, uh, you know, some floodlights. Uh, you know, initially, you know, they were out at the out at the doors, and they would penetrate twenty feet or so, and <laughs> and uh, uh, you had to be very careful about movement uh, there, and also the uh, the supplied air carts that we used. At that time, uh, initially, I'm not sure they even fed refrigerated air. But at any rate, uh, to you know, you had to pull the air hose uh, with you, uh, which fed your mask. There was certainly no refrigeration, no ventilation within the building at that time. It also turned out that this initial work was in the summertime when it was hot. And so you would uh, go in there, and within uh, 
15 minutes uh, you were you were perspiring and I can recall when uh, well, some of the first times I went in there by the time I, I came out uh, there would just be you know in my my booties and all of that of course was was a plastic impervious to a uh, to ventilation that's what you needed but that meant that it, uh, you know, all the perspiration also just kind of ran down your body and, and collected <laughs> in your booties. And, and I can remember that it was, uh, you know, just so uncomfortable uh, uh, working there with under all of those conditions. We gradually got uh, got better uh, refrigeration. Uh, cart so that at least the air supplied was initially cooled off uh, more to, to help out um, in some of this. Uh, yeah. So when you went in there, um, what were you doing? Were you just sort of picking stuff up? And, uh, the initially we went in and and looked for any any little piles of of burned plutonium now. Now, when plutonium metal burns, and there had been a lot of plutonium metal in that foundry line there, when plutonium metal burns, uh, it it's a little bit like a, a charcoal briquette burning. You, you've seen that burn, and, and it just forms kind of some white ash on the outside, and it, uh, if it's undisturbed, you know, the ash just kind of collects uh, down there. Well, well plutonium, uh, Kind of burns that way. It just sits there and glows. Uh, there isn't any any big flame. Uh, there just kind of glows, uh, oxidizes, and it forms sort of a a, a greenish uh, powder uh, there. And so initially we we went in and we looked. You know, we're, we're looking for little piles of of any plutonium uh, oxide. You know, any concentrated areas of plutonium oxide, any metal that might still exist, but there wasn't much left as metal and we would uh, uh, pick up the uh, scoop into little uh, containers uh, any plutonium to package it and and get it uh, out well for recovery but but recovery was not the primary uh, concern it was to get it out to reduce any uh, any problem uh, of later cleanup uh, and also, initially, one of the big uh, efforts was that we had you know, a few uh, well, some underpasses, uh, some steps under glove box lines, and a few other uh, old little pits, if you were, some, some areas where, uh, you know, where water had collected from fighting the fire. And one of the early efforts uh, undertaken carefully was to drain this water out uh, because we we didn't really want to disturb it. Obviously, uh, nothing had gone critical at that time, but we, if there was a, uh, you know, some pile of plutonium on the bottom of this water, which was was just barely subcritical. Then we didn't want to uh, disturb it and put it in a a condition where it, it did uh, go critical. Uh, uh, now that term is I know that's a little vague, but I mean uh, plutonium itself. Uh, well, well, it's a hazardous material, but but it's just a little pile of, of oxide. Uh, it doesn't really hurt anything. You can put a, a your hand with a rubber glove on it, you can hold it in your hand and it's no problem. But if too much of it gets in one place and it's moderated by uh, by water, uh, then it can, uh, then the, the criticality event or a nuclear reaction can occur and a tremendous amount of, of heat is generated and uh, and people in the near, facility, uh, near vicinity die uh, is basically what it is. And, and we certainly wanted to avoid uh, avoid you know disturbing uh, anything to cause a criticality event. So the the point was that the water 
and some other things were moved very carefully to to avoid this. Uh, there. Now, and even, then, I understand that even the presence of your the your body, if, if something was subcritical, could make it go critical. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, that can occur too. So, right and so and uh, so, uh, you know, yeah, you know, it was. You know, right now we can uh, look back at it and say, uh, well, yeah, they, uh, that was pretty well done. But, you know, but at that time, you know, you, you just didn't know what was going to happen in the next uh, five minutes. And, and so, yes, it was, uh, it was, you know, a big occasion. And again, I, uh, I'm not sure Bruce Owen and his immediate uh, uh, crew there really got the, the thanks that they deserved for it. Planning this and conducting that, you know, uh, certainly the whole thing was a tragic event uh, there, but but at least it wasn't made any worse by the death of people uh, or any serious injury during the recovery uh, operations. Okay. Well, we have are at 56 minutes, so um, why don't we take a break and I'll change the tape. And, uh, okay. Very good. Moral History Project. I'm interviewing Ken Calkins. It's the 2nd of February, 2005. And I'm Hannah Nordhaus, and uh, we're at Ken's house in Golden. So, um, yes. we just finished talking about the 69 fire um, and wondering if there are any more memorable incidents that you wanted to share. Well, there are. Uh, uh, there are some, you know, I could waste a lot of time on a lot of little details, but, but actually, uh, maybe I should move on a bit. The, the, the 69 fire, although uh, uh, certainly very unfortunate and regrettable, did lead to an assignment uh, for me that, that turned out to be an, an interesting assignment. When, uh, after the fire, the, uh, the Department of Energy uh, requested uh, certainly a a in-depth safety review of of a lot of of things uh, including how to rebuild uh, the the lost production capability but also uh, how you know any other potential hazards that were uh, around that might uh, create the next catastrophe and so we did uh, uh, a, a number of projects uh, came out of that, and one of them was that uh, during this period in which I was working in uh, on cleanup of Building 776 one day a week, uh, my group uh, was asked to look at at uh, ways to minimize uh, the possibility of of further fires in fabrication areas. And included in this was uh, the examination of, of uh, different atmospheres that would prevent uh, a fire from occurring. And so we did uh, studies on, on what we can generally call inerting of, of uh, production systems. And uh, as a result of these studies, then we submitted and uh, uh, a project to uh, to apply a, a quote inert end quote atmosphere to uh, certain fabrication facilities where the potential for fire was uh, was significant, and this project uh, was approved, and then uh, I was uh, appointed as as a project manager for that project, which was called uh, the inert the glove box inerting project. In it, we had, uh, in our initial studies, we had looked at, at various uh, materials that might be used. Uh, we had recommended in our studies that uh, that f the that certain fabrication facilities where where plutonium was uh, was in a form that could be uh, fairly easily ignited. Uh, be uh, supplied with an inert atmosphere. The, we recommended nitrogen atmosphere. 
Nitrogen is not truly an inert gas. Uh, uh, nitrogen will form compounds with, with uh, other materials and it does, uh, well, it will react. Uh, other gases, argon or, or helium particularly, from the standpoint of inerting, would be, uh, would be more effective, but they're also far, far more expensive and for the purposes that we encountered, we determined that nitrogen w was really a, a quite satisfactory. So uh, I became project manager for the a project to apply a, uh, that inert atmosphere. We, uh, we modified a lot of the, atmos uh, the uh, boxes and then uh, uh, extended that to building 707. Uh, 779. Uh, on that project, we did uh, a contract with a with a private company, Air Products and Chemicals Incorporated, to build uh, and operate an on-site nitrogen plant, uh, whose only uh, purpose was to supply nitrogen to our our uh, facilities there. And that uh, was itself a uh, an interesting uh, a project. It it uh, took all together four years uh, to design, to build, uh, put in operation. Uh, you know, we we uh, came out quite well on the schedule and the costs there. Uh, I got to uh, have a few experiences there that, that I wouldn't otherwise have had. I uh, you know I worked with uh, Dow's Engineering Construction Division in Houston uh, uh, on that. Uh, our, the architect engineer that was selected was uh, a company, uh, their name then was Ralph M. Parsons Company from, from California who did our design work, a very capable uh, team. And of course got to work with the, uh, with the nitrogen plant Constructor, Air Products and Chemicals Incorporated, and uh, and got a you know, some experiences that I wouldn't have uh, have otherwise uh, uh, under undergone there. So that was, uh, as I say, kind of uh, rather interesting. One little uh, from my own personal viewpoint. I don't. This probably wasn't any benefit to Rocky Flats, but to me. Uh, uh, it, it was an interesting part of my my memories that uh, at about the time the well uh, shortly after our project was completed uh, there and put in operation uh, uh, successfully with with few startup problems uh, and I had uh, I we just closed the project and I had then been a been a, a Signed, I was then uh, assistant production superintendent in building 771. Okay. One day, I got a phone call from the uh, the plant manager. That was Jim Haynes at that time, uh, general manager of the plant. And his call was was uh, rather vague. He just said uh, he had a call on another line that he was going to transfer to me, and uh, and all he wanted to tell me was that whatever they wanted, give it to them. And uh, so then he transferred the call and turned out to be from a, uh, the plant manager of another Dow plant, this was, this was still in the Dow Chemical Company days, in Stade, Germany. And Stade is a, is a, a town, a city of Germany, about, uh, it's on the Elbe River, about halfway down the river between uh, Hamburg and the uh, Atlantic Ocean uh, there. It turns out that the week before uh, the Stadi plant had had a, uh, an explosion and fire in a methyl cellulose plant and as a condition of, of a resuming operation to the German government they had agreed that they would apply an inner atmosphere to their uh, facilities and the uh, the plant manager had 
heard that Dow had a you know, had an inner uh, facility go in at Rocky Flats, so he was interested in <coughs> trying to get uh, information. So the net result of all of that was that uh, he asked me if I could come to Germany to uh, consult with him on this for a, a few weeks and. I remembered the plant manager, or our Jim Haynes had said, whatever he wanted, give it to them. So I said I thought I could and, uh, and arranged that. And the, uh, two days later, I was on the airplane going to Germany for a, for a couple of weeks. And, uh, and uh, we worked on that. Uh, but then at the, uh, at the end of my, uh, my business there, I also took some time off in uh, in Germany and visited friends in Norway and, and went to England for the first time. So, so that was a little uh, personal memory I, I got from that uh, association with that uh, project. The, the German plant ultimately did indeed uh, successfully install their project uh, also. Uh, let's see, where, was, where else was I? That then brought brought us back to about the, uh, that's when I resumed uh, work in Building 771, became Building Superintendent uh, then, and then to, uh, to Building 371 uh, there. And uh, really, uh, I, although uh, trying to start building 371 was uh, was probably my final, you know, major responsibility uh, uh, from an operations uh, point of view. When it became apparent that that wouldn't run, uh, Rockwell. This was now in in the days of uh, Rockwell International. Uh, initiated another construction uh, project to rebuild the facilities in a, a Jerry, uh, what's his name? And we came in to head that project. And so I became a, a technical staff assistant to uh, Bill Weston, the, uh, the plutonium operations manager at that time. And uh, then we, uh, initiated a a project. Uh, the whole complex, the whole plutonium recovery complex within the DOE, was having trouble. Uh, partly because of the failure of building 371, partly because of the of the aging 771, partly because of some other uh, problems. Uh, uh, they were having trouble recovering the plutonium from various types of of residues, we call them. And residue is, is essentially anything that contains some, uh, some recoverable amount of plutonium, but it has to be processed in order to get it back and purify it. And the, the system was having trouble getting that done, so a, so a committee was formed to uh, to look at nationwide uh, capabilities, uh, uh, establish, well, we already had, but this was kind of expanded, what were called economic discard limits for uh, determining what was recoverable and what wasn't. And then, uh, well, it's sort of connected, but not uh, directly, uh, a uh, some technical committees uh, called JOWOGs, uh, Joint Working Groups, uh, were established with uh, with English, uh, the the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Agency, and so I was uh, a member of a a JOWOG uh, uh, group for plutonium processing, uh, which included. Uh, other facilities within the United States, and also some some English facilities, and that was also uh, interesting. It turns out that we would usually have one meeting per year in America and one in England, and uh, 
and would review and, and discuss prob operating problems with facilities and how we did things and, and, uh, and help each other with problems and working with the English and the visiting there was, was also very interesting from my uh, personal standpoint. Uh, there. And we probably helped, uh, I think, the, uh, the complex in plutonium processing problems. Uh, there. And so, um, were you, when did you retire? I retired from uh, full-time work uh, the end of February 1989, just about 16 years ago at the, at the end of this month. Uh, there. However, I then also did some consulting after that uh, uh, there for, uh, well, for other companies, uh, uh, but also for Rocky Flats for a time. As a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> I uh, recall that one of the jobs I was doing, you know, there was was primarily for Bill Weston, who was the the uh, uh, plutonium production uh, plutonium op director of plutonium operations. I guess his title was, and uh, we had scheduled a review of of my work, and and I was reporting on it and getting ready to complete that in uh, whatever way it. it whatever day it was of the summer of 1989 and in, in the, uh, was it August or whenever. At any rate, uh, I got out there a little ahead of time and uh, stopped to speak to a few old friends of mine and uh, went into Bill's outer office uh, there a little bit, bit before our meeting to say hello to people. and. Bill's secretary uh, at that time commented that, well, Bill was acting for the plant manager, Dominic Sankini, uh, today as acting plant manager, and, uh, and he was going to be delayed a little bit. And about that time, you know, I, I kind of observed without paying too much attention some you know, kind of commotion or some action out in the hallway that I didn't uh, really pay too much attention to. And, uh, and the time kind of dragged out and it really kind of went through my mind that uh, uh, Bill was a little bit rude to keep me waiting so long. And about that time, the, uh, his secretary came out and said, you know, an emergency had come up and Bill just wouldn't be able to meet with me that day. And it turns out that was the day of the infam infamous uh, FBI uh, uh, raid, uh, if you call it, at, at Rocky Flats. So, um, so I was there that day, but I didn't really have any uh, any a, any direct further participation in that. Uh, there. Did you um, feel that it was warranted? What you well, I really thought the whole thing was was kind of absurd, uh, kind of foolish. Um, I have never. Uh, you know, seen any official report. I don't know the the real basis. Uh, just from what I have heard, that I, I first, uh, or I understand that the FBI had gotten some information that the Building 771 Recovery Incinerator, which I think was the, the uh, focal point of the whole thing, was being operated at midnight. Well, of course, it was operated at midnight. It was um, it was also operated at ten o'clock in the morning and three o'clock in the afternoon because that incinerator, by its nature, takes about uh, oh three to four hours really to get going on a on an equal equilibrium basis. When you're through burning, it takes another three or four hours to cool off and remove the material and so on. So. So if you only operated, you know, during the day, uh, you'd get about one hour of production uh, for a day's work. And, and so when it was started up, uh, usually on Monday morning, you know, it was just operated for a, for a full week until a Friday evening. At that time, we were not operate. We operated 24 hours a day, five days a week uh, there. So we'd shut down Friday evening. So if the 
implication was that anything operated at midnight, you know, there must be some skullduggery afoot. Uh, you know, that, that's that's ridiculous. Uh, in the beginning, uh, there it, it had to be. Uh, I also understood that they uh, they had taken some infrared uh, photos from a helicopter and, and found you know something was operating in the building. And again. Uh, from a technical standpoint, uh, that's rather ridiculous. The, when we hear the term incinerator, we, uh, we, can envi we generally envision some big hot uh, facility. But that building, three, 771 incinerator, was a very small little box. And the amount of heat generated from that incinerator was much less than, than a lot of other sources within the building, uh, fr from the reduction furnaces and even from ventilation fans, uh, et cetera. So, the, uh, so infrared photos uh, on that building would not have revealed anything about the incinerator uh, operation. And then uh, another point that, <laughs> that uh, this uh, I guess was technically true, but uh, I heard later that the charges were that some waste was being incinerated, which should not have been uh, incinerated uh, because we were doing it to, quote, avoid EPA uh, regulations. Well, this uh, maybe it was technically true, but it kind of uh, showed, uh, well, I don't know, Kind of a misunderstanding, perhaps, on our part. The uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, we had done a lot of work on what was called economic discard limits, which basically uh, determine at what point some contaminated residue uh, must be recovered for recovery and reuse of the plutonium versus where it is is so dilute that it uh, should be discarded as contaminated waste. Well, at Rocky Flats, we really always interpreted these limits as, as um, well, minimum limits. That is, if it's above a our discard limit, the residue had to be reprocessed. If it was a little bit below the limit, however, and we had an excess, uh, you know, uh, maybe the incinerator still had a few hours it could run that week, and we had some some a residue that was slightly below the the limit. Uh, there, uh, we didn't think there was anything wrong. As a matter of fact, we thought we were doing something good to go ahead and operate to recover that uh, plutonium, even though we weren't. Uh, you know, officially required to do so. So we thought operating, uh, recovering something under the limit was, was a good thing. We didn't realize that it would be considered a violation of the uh, of EPA rules uh, uh, to do that. So the uh, result was, you know, I thought that whole, uh, that whole incident was, was a little bit absurd. Uh, there from the standpoint of what it did and, and whether that um, justified shutting down uh, an entire very expensive production facility. So uh, what did you think about the decision to shut it down and stop production? Well, um, I felt that didn't need to be, do, to be done, of course, to a uh, Uh, let's see, that was before the, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, somewhat later, when the, when the Soviet Union uh, you know, collapsed, uh, uh, that did rather decrease you know, the competitive pressure on the United States to, uh, uh, to maintain its lead in, the, in nuclear weapons. But, uh, but I really th thought it was... Uh, it was unnecessary and uh, 
to shut down the facilities and and uh, abandon them. And that indeed a, a tremendous uh, capability is is being wasted there. Even given um, the aging facilities and the difficulty in getting the new building up and running, did you <coughs> <kind of> <coughs> Certainly, building 771 itself uh, was aging, and and it had uh, you know passed its prime. And shutting down uh, re building 771 itself, uh, no, I can't argue against that. Also, uh, and I I recognize that. Uh, I just said that building 371, which was supposed to be the replacement for 771, uh, was not not a real viable production facility. So something else needed to be done, and whatever whatever else was done uh, was indeed going to cost a lot of money uh, there. So there is a there is a gap there. I I, I don't. Uh, Disagree with shutting down uh, uh, and removing building 771, but I think the uh, uh, the total uh, complex did not need to be lost. And indeed, you know, DOE is is uh, now working on you know some some alternate and reduced. Capacity facilities that uh, they'll cost a lot of money anyway, so someplace. Now, what about um, the argument and the fact that that the area became so highly populated um, that it was a very different place in 1990 than it was in 1953? Yeah. Well, certainly, uh, if you were. If you're considering siting a, a brand new facility now, you wouldn't put it uh, out there at, at Rocky Flats. Um, there, it would be someplace else. Uh, I notice, however, that wherever the the DOE uh, considers siting any facility, there is there is tremendous resistance. Uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a Yucca Mountain Waste uh, Repository. Yucca Mountain is. It's hard to imagine any place any more remote uh, and any more useless ground within the continental United States as Yucca Mountain, and even that has you know, has tremendous uh, uh, opposition uh, being voiced. The uh, the uh, waste isolation pilot plant, no longer pilot plant. In uh, near Carlsbad, New Mexico, for uh, for waste again, that uh, area is not uh, good for much of anything else. Uh, well, I sh uh, that's not a good thing to say, but but it is quite remote there, and it has tremendous opposition. But uh, the point of that is that I'm not sure where. They can build any facility in uh, in the United States without getting great uh, opposition. The question is whether uh, Rocky Flats is enough of a threat to this uh, area that it uh, really needed to be abandoned. I personally think, although uh, lots of others might disagree, that it was not a threat. I think it, it never has been. I personally believe, although um, there are others who believe otherwise, that no member of the public has ever been injured as a result of operations at Rocky Flats. Now some years ago, uh, what was his name, Dr. Carl Johnson from the uh, Jefferson County Health Department, you know, he, he uh, did studies and he issued uh, information saying that whatever it was, five people in the Denver area had, had uh, contracted uh, cancer as a result of Rocky Flats operation. But but that's a very statistical uh, 
uh, basis and, and nobody can really say you know, who those five were and, and whether that, that really occurred uh, or not. Uh, and the five uh, is just my own made-up number, I don't know that. Anyway, the, uh, 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 I don't think Rocky Flats uh, you know, was ever a hazard. I think it was operated uh, uh, very safely. If it was a hazard to, uh, to the metropolitan area, then it indeed must have been a much greater hazard to the employees working there. And hardly any of the employees working there ever, uh, I think, considered it a hazard. In fact, uh, you look at that, uh, I have read in the paper that uh, your state representative from Boulder County, uh, what's his name, once a, a sign put up uh, saying that you know, as they build the, uh, the hiking trails on the wildlife refuge out there, we should put up a sign that, that says uh, essentially that's hazardous area. And I, uh, I don't know, I'm not demonstrating against that, but I think uh, even that is kind of pointless. Um, if that's considered a hazardous area now, then for those individuals uh, like me and, and 10,000 others who, um, who worked at Rocky Flats uh, full time, you would have to say that we were either unaware of the hazards of working out there, of the hazards of radiation and contamination, or else we ignored the hazards, we, we discounted them. Well, I'm sure there were some who, um, who didn't really, weren't really aware of the, the problem, but for most of the people who worked there, professional people, you know, fully understood the, uh, the hazards of radioactive materials, of radiation, of contamination. Uh, we understood them you know, far better than almost any of the uh, protesters uh, uh, did, the, uh, uh, certainly far better than an FBI uh, uh, manager does. So I don't think th there's a valid point that we were unaware of the hazards. So if not that, then, uh, then they say, well, we, we must have ignored the hazards to work there. And, but you know, I don't know anybody at Rocky Flats that was ever uh, suicidal. Uh, uh, none of us wanted anything to happen to us. None of us want anything to happen to our families uh, you know, who might live around the area. But we were uh, you know, completely uh, uh, convinced that that the operation was safe and that no uh, uh, no ill effects were going to be uh, uh, gained. Now, yes, uh, there were several fires that were unfortunate, but even those fires were uh, contained within the the uh, limits of of what we'd established as the uh, as a barrier for protection. Were you um, ever exposed to? Any contamination? Well, certainly to contamination. Uh, and again, th this is an area where, where people don't understand uh, very well that uh, the, there is certainly a relationship between contamination and radiation, but there, uh, there's, there's a difference between contamination and radiation. Contamination uh, within the industry uh, we consider as the, uh, you know, as the direct uh, contact uh, with, with material, and in this, this case we're talking primarily plutonium, of course, uh, on, the, on the body, in the body some way. If, if the contamination Is, is on the outside. Uh, it is not penetrating. Uh, the, a little piece of plastic, uh, certainly, the dead skin on your, on your hand uh, uh, prevents uh, contamination uh, itself from 
injuring the body. The problem with contamination uh, to you uh, lies if it is ingested and particularly if, if it is breathed into the lungs, then some percentage of it uh, will lodge in the lungs and can cause uh, cancer. If it is, uh, if it goes to the stomach uh, there, then, uh, then less of it will be lodged there and it will be ex excreted. The, if plutonium simply gets on your skin, and then going back to your question then, have I been contaminated? Uh, yes, I've had uh, plutonium contamination on my, on my hands, more so in the early days when we didn't have quite so many barriers. And if it's, uh, if it's washed off uh, uh, fairly promptly, why, why nothing bad results from it. The, the few uh, incidents that I believe were serious and did affect some employees were cases in which for one reason or another uh, some barriers failed and they uh, uh, they breathed in, or had, or, or also I didn't mention, if it, if you cut your hand and there's plutonium in the cut, that can be a, you know, stay in your hand, in your body and cause some, some cancer scope. But those are the situations that are inter are of concern in contamination uh, there, in which, uh, <coughs> in which plutonium is ingested in and lodges in the lungs uh, and stays there. Uh, in radiation now, radiation is is generally a, a little bit different and comes from uh, either neutrons or x-rays, particularly or gamma rays, that are penetrating and can actually penetrate through uh, forms of matter, including through your, you know, through your skin and your body and, and can uh, uh, penetrate to uh, damage internal organs. Uh, you know, I have had some of that, uh, uh, nothing very serious compared to others. As a matter of fact, uh, I, uh, I've pointed out that uh, you know, we receive that type of radiation uh, to a limited extent all the time from the sun, from any x-ray that you might get uh, you know, in the course of, of examination of your body or treatment of the body. Along the way sometime I got picked up some uh, pneumonia. Not, I'm not saying from Rocky Flats, so, you know, I just got a case of pneumonia uh, there and uh, in the treatment had, had a number of x-rays to see how the pneumonia was developing. Well, it turns out I got probably more radiation from that pneumonia treatment, which turned out very well, and I'm, and I'm grateful for it, but I got more uh, radiation from that than from my work at Rocky Flats uh, there. So, so I, I have had uh, you know, some of, of both uh, contamination uh, there and some penetrating radiation at Rocky Flats, but, but nothing serious and, and not as much as, as quite a few of the employees have had received. So did it worry you at, at the time it happened? Or it no, not really. Like, uh, like you know, getting a serious cut on your finger, you know, you, you know, it, it's possible you could get an infection in there and, and lose your whole arm, but it's, it's pretty unlikely, so you don't spend any time worrying, and I didn't worry much about it, you know. Pardon me? How, do you, were there specific instances you remember being exposed to radiation or, or did it, you just test positive? Oh, let's see, I can't really remember uh, specific incidents. Mostly, see, uh, you're probably aware that anybody working in the, in the what we call hot area, you know, where, where plutonium is, uh, wore a, a film badge uh, there to, to monitor uh, and record forever and ever the amount of radiation that you did receive. And over a time, you know, my, my film badges have shown uh, some, uh, picked up some penetrating radiation. 
I don't re really recall specific things that might have caused that. In, in, uh, well, in the technology, uh, having uh, uh, plutonium fluoride uh, uh, does indeed uh, cause plutonium. And there was a time in development work when, when uh, we were working on, with plutonium fluoride to try to develop some processes, and that was probably the source of some radiation. But, but I don't recall any, any big incidents. Broader picture, uh, how did you feel about working in a plant that produced a key element of nuclear weapons? Well, uh, basically, uh, fundamentally, I, I felt uh, quite good about it. Uh, I think one of your earlier questions was, uh, you know, was there any problem when I couldn't discuss my work with, with my family? Because, you know, in the early days, uh, security was, was much more. Uh, Restrictive than in than in later years, and and you, although it wasn't a security uh, infraction itself, you know essentially you didn't even mention the word plutonium uh, uh, to your to your families or your your, your social friends uh, and so on, and this uh, oh it might have been you know just a, a little bit of a of an annoyance, but. But it didn't really bother me very much. We just didn't do that. And well, to be honest, you know, most of the public doesn't understand what chemical engineering is all about anyway. So I, so even if my work had been in, uh, in something else, I, I probably uh, wouldn't discuss that work with, uh, with social friends, uh, to extent. So the, uh, but the security aspects. Uh, well, internally, you know, uh, the security you know, can certainly significantly reduce efficiency, but from any external standpoint, the security didn't uh, especially bother me. As far as the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the job uh, satisfaction and rewards, uh, you know, uh, I felt it was a, it was a good place to work. The uh, uh, the salaries, you know, were, were certainly fair, uh, uh, good. The uh, the rewards of working there were were uh, rather intangible, but you know, but you really got to feel that you were part of something very significant. Um, you know, there there was a time when I believe uh, seriously that I was uh, among the top 100 people in the world in my knowledge and understanding of of plutonium design and processing facilities. Well, a hundred people in the world sounds pretty good. It turns out there weren't very many, so, <laughs> so, so, so that's not too great. But, but you did feel, you know, that you were, uh, or at least I felt, that uh, I was part of something uh, significant. Back when I was in college, you know, one of my uh, uh, a part-time job was producing sugar in a, in a sugar uh, a factory, and you know, producing sugar isn't very uh, significant or glamorous. Uh, maybe working with plutonium isn't glamorous, but it, it's at least uh, different. And I felt uh, going on uh, on to more the uh, the social and the, uh, the responsible citizen uh, viewpoint that uh, you know I feel very confident that uh, because of the work done at Rocky Flats, uh, you know, the United States uh, has stayed a, a free country, uh, you know, uh, we, we uh, certainly no country uh, would dare attack us uh, you know, when we had the capability that had been produced largely at Rocky Flats, or a lot of it at Rocky Flats, not, not exclusively, but, but we were part of that uh, of the complex that produced a, a great deterrent to any um, any threat. Yeah. Um, so um, I had forgot to ask you early on. Um, you had said when you first heard about Rocky Floods, you didn't quite know what it did. Um, when did you figure out 
what you were going to do and, and what was your initial response to learning about the mission? Well, before I went to work there, uh, you know, I did hear that it was a part of the Department of, or the, uh, what was in the Atomic Energy Commission weapons complex. And that's really about all I knew, and, and so you knew that. Uh, uh, I, I don't think I even knew that it would involve uh, plutonium and uranium until after I went to work there. Even if I had, I didn't know much about those materials, so I, uh, uh, so it might not have meant anything to me. But uh, yes, uh, you know, back then y you didn't really find out much of anything until you did uh, uh, go to work and get into it. And, and from one standpoint, you know, maybe that was too late. But we, uh, but uh, it, uh, other than a few surprises, you know. I, I adapted well. I think I, I accepted the, uh, oh, the the challenge of of just another uh, industry to work on. Although I I do um, know, uh, and this is uh, uh, kind of amusing when you look at it in res at, in retrospect. You know, back before I went to work, you know, like any uh, whatever I was, um, maybe 28 years. Was that what when I went to work there? Uh, you know, I, I was you know, a, I guess, ambitious a young man. You know, I was looking at a career uh, there, and I knew that even though I didn't understand fully the difference between uh, weapons technology and nuclear power technology. Uh, certainly, they are related. Uh, there, I knew that, and I, I really felt that that uh, nuclear power was was you know a, a great uh, future for America, and by getting in here, you know, I'd I'd have access to that uh, industry as as a career there. Well, it uh, turns out that uh, the, the nuclear Industry, you know, hasn't really uh, developed as many of us thought it would anyway there. And I also probably didn't uh, fully appreciate the the difference between, you know, weapons uh, work, which we did, and, and nuclear power work, which is where I thought the future would be uh, there. Uh, I didn't appreciate that, but you know, a number of other uh, companies that were a lot bigger and with more resources than I did uh, also failed. You know, um, for instance, Dow Chemical Company uh, operated the plant as a public service, but they and other uh, of the contractors at that time thought that they were getting in on the ground floor of of nuclear technology. Uh, you know, which they uh, expected to ride uh, for success in the future. And almost all of them, you know, have, have bowed out because they, they see it as hardly any benefit uh, financially and a, and a great big de detriment from the standpoint of, of public uh, uh, recognition. Uh, there. So. Um, speaking of public relations, uh, how, how, did, how did you feel about the protests? The protests. Rough, rough, yeah. Well, again, I, I thought they were kind of, uh, kind of misguided. I thought uh, many of them you know, did not. Uh, although I'm, I'm sure they were sincere, I thought they uh, they greatly overestimated the hazards of Rocky Flats to anybody else. I thought they didn't didn't understand very well as as I thought I understood, and and I'm not saying I was right, I'm just saying I thought there, there was a difference there, that, but they didn't understand our need as a nation, you know, to maintain a position in which uh, we could not uh, be attacked, uh, you know, and especially back when the Cold War was, was really a Cold War, when, uh, when there really was competition in 
in how fast and how good you could go with these things. So I thought the protesters were, uh, uh, were, were just kind of immature in their uh, a viewpoint on how the world is conducted uh, there. There, none of them ever really you know, bothered me personally uh, there, even on the, uh, you know, on the demonstrations right outside Rocky Flats. Uh, you know, they didn't really hinder us uh, from our work. Uh, we could go in. So, so they weren't, weren't any significant problem to me. I just didn't really agree with them. Um, well, we only have about 10 minutes, and I wanted to ask you one question, um, and then I thought if you just want to wrap up whatever else you have to say. Sure. Um, I'm wondering, as a building supervisor, you must have had a lot of dealings with the union. Yes. And, and I wanted to get your perspective on union management relations and, and maybe how that changed from Dow to, to Rockwell and EG&G. Yes. This was after your time, so Dow and Rockwell. Okay. The only, uh, you know, that, that was another difference between uh, operations at Rocky Flats and, and uh, previously. <clears throat> I had, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, you know, back when I was in, in college, I was a, uh, uh, on summertime jobs and so on, I, I had been a union member. My father uh, had been a, uh, a union member. My, my brother, well, he became a, a superintendent, but he had been a union member. Uh, I didn't have any any problem with the uh, with the union concept of uh, you know, of joining together to uh, to have a, a stronger economic voice in dealing with uh, with companies there. And even in the early days at Rocky Flats, uh, you know, we didn't have any big union uh, uh, problems uh, there. You know, we could get along quite well with our our staff. Uh, I'm not sure when it really started, uh, and there was no no specific uh, dividing line, I don't think. But but gradually, indeed, uh, you know, union activity did get to be a, a more and more problem. And to me, I think that the problem is it became very divisive. Uh, uh, you know, when you're, you know, when you're operating a facility, whatever you, uh, you need the, you know, the, the effort and the services of, of everybody from, uh, from the top down to the fellow that cleans out the bathroom, uh, there all the time, and it, it, it got you know along the way sometime uh, as if you know you, you could hardly even speak to some of the people unless you had a union representative there to make sure that. Uh, uh, the tears. So, so I s saw in there some uh, just obstacles to getting the work done when I thought we all you know, really ought to be on the same team uh, there. And Dow, uh, the, by the, its nature as a company, you know, Dow tended indeed to be a rather combative uh, against the union. You know, they were. And they had, and you can see some uh, justification. Uh, they had their their unions, uh, you know, which were much bigger. Uh, there at the, in Midland and Freeport, uh, Texas, and they couldn't uh, commercially. They couldn't afford from back there uh, to give the employees at, at Rocky Flats. Uh, any special breaks because they knew those uh, the unions would then come back and uh, and demand that in their private operations. So even though maybe DOE would be paying for it at, at Rocky Flats, um, they could still sit you know being expanded to their private operations. So Dow tended to uh, you know to fight back uh, uh, against the union. And that was one of, uh, I don't think it was a controlling thing, but one of the things that caused uh, Dow's uh, departure from Rocky Flats. Rockwell uh, tended to be you know, a little more accommodating to the Union. Uh, I say a little bit. Uh, uh, Rockwell also found that you know, 
it wasn't easy. You know, you couldn't just completely give in to um, anything they said. Uh, Rockwell still had to manage the plant. So, so maybe the conflict between Rockwell and the unions wasn't quite as great as between Dow, but, but uh, uh, there was still some there. Now, and I certainly have had you know, a lot of good friends who were union members, and we got along very well uh, there. But also, uh, you know, had some some very difficult times when uh, you know some union members would you know just uh, you know fight right up to the uh, to the last minute you know for their quote rights uh, or whatever it was. So yes. Uh, uh, the union, uh, in operations, the union uh, activities did give us some problems uh, there. Okay, well, we have about five minutes, so um, if you just want, if you have anything. Um, well, let's there. see. Uh, I don't recall anything uh, special I haven't uh, covered along the way. Uh, I think, in, in summary, uh, I. My work at Rocky Flats, uh, I believe, was satisfying to me. I was, uh, you know, I'm proud to have been a part of it. I think we did uh, did did some good work for the nation. I don't think that we have uh, injured you know, the public uh, along the way in in doing that. Uh, there. Um, what well, What do you think were the best and worst things about working there? Well, I don't know. Probably, uh, probably the worst was uh, was that '69 fire and, and its aftermath, which uh, you know, which uh, caused a lot of things. I don't know the the best. Uh, it's hard to pick out something out of there. A lot of good friends, of course, uh, but you you meet them every place uh, there. Uh, I don't think that's unique to Rocky Flats. Uh, there, but uh, I'd have a hard time picking out the best thing. Mm. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, anything else? Oh, well, I think that's all I can think of to say. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for for participating. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Recording. So, one more. Okay. Thing. Uh, I do think of one other thing, and this is the general nature of the safety of operations at Rocky Flats um, there. And I think uh, there was a time when it was recognized as, as the safest place to work in the state of Colorado. Back before OSHA was, was the official uh, safety organization, an organization called the National Safety Council was was rather the umbrella organization under which uh, safety w was measured and and uh, and conducted. And Rocky Flats, you know, very often won the award as the safest place to work in the state of Colorado. We uh, that was usually measured by the number of of lost time injuries, uh, safety incidents, uh, deaths, if any, et cetera, and. Uh, and we very often led the pack. We received a lot of uh, of safety awards. Uh, there, you know, j just physical little gifts that uh, that weren't big, but just to uh, to keep safety in our uh, uh, in our thoughts. Uh, we would have safety teams, and at certain milestones, uh, you know, we we'd be, have a, a safety dinner dance at some nice off-site uh, uh, place, and. And everybody on the team, you know, would come with with spouses or friends or whatever, whoever it was you bought. Uh, and again, this was just to keep safety uh, in the forefront. And and even you know, way before uh, you know, all the public pressure, you know, we would uh, we were required to have a monthly safety meeting, discuss all of the any potential uh, hazards in the area, to uh, to make sure that we were doing things uh, as safe as possible and, and probably safer than, than most other industrial facilities are there. Okay, uh, that's a primary uh, okay. uh, focus of what I wanted to say. All right, well thank you again.
Yeah. You're welcome. Jacket, and what else was that? Yeah. Well, let's see. <coughs> it's the safety blanket. Okay. Let's see. See if I can focus in. Now, this is the safety spoon. <laughs> For 19 million man hour safety award, June 29th, 1962. Where did you it's have engraved that? on it.